Welcome, everybody. There we go. Nice. People will still be trickling in, but uh, what we like to do with our Drink Atlantic seminars is if you could use the chat function to just type in quickly where you're tuning in from. It's been really neat to see how worldwide the cocktail festival has been able to uh, to go with the power of the internet. So um, we're based in Halifax. We're a cocktail festival that's in its third year. So two years uh, starting, we, we did like events and in-person education and brought um, some leaders from our industry from around the world to Halifax to help educate our industry and our consumers, but also to celebrate, um, you know, our distillers, our bartenders, our great restaurants and bars here and our scene, uh, as well as our city. So we wanted to highlight that to the rest of the world to showcase how really great it is to, to visit Halifax. Um, so in year three, obviously, we couldn't travel like we wanted to. And um, hopefully we'll be able to next year. So if you're just tuning in and learning about Drink Atlantic for the first time, welcome. Um, you can find all of our information on drinkatlantic.com and now it's also on our um, mynslc.com. So the NSLC is one of our banner sponsors along with WSCT, um, who has uh, been a major help in putting this one together and is currently educating 1,500 bartenders in Canada. So doing an excellent job in, in outreach and educating our industry, which is kind of like the pillar of what we do with Drink Atlantic is try to provide education opportunities for everybody. Um, the, the panel today is going to be all about rum and a deeper dive into rum. So I, I'm really excited because um, Halifax has a deep connection with rum. Our tavern culture um, was built on it and a lot of our economy was as well. So it's a topic that's near and dear to Nova Scotians and we have some excellent, excellent guests that we'll, we will introduce a little bit later on. But I'd like to um, start off by acknowledging that we are taking some time um, on the internet and in the physical space to market right now when there are some more important issues at the, the, the heart that we need to address and change, especially in our industry, but in many industries. So um, one of the things that we thought, how could we help um, the Black Lives Matter um, movement and see more BIPOC people behind the bar, in bars, becoming distillers, owning distilleries, owning bars, um, start to take small steps to help. So um, a friend of mine that I've known basically my whole life has joined us today. His name is Dorico Simons, and he is an activist, very active in the Halifax community, um, and that I, you know, have the utmost respect for. Um, he is a member of many different organizations, but we are gonna be making a donation to his organization today, um, ACE, which he'll speak a little bit more about. But before I just pass it over to Dorico, I wanted to just highlight a few things about this, um, this gentleman who's been able to accomplish amazing things in his uh, short time on this earth. So he's currently employed full-time with the HRM as a program manager with the Youth Advocate Program part-time with Mount St. Vincent University as Black Student Support Coordinator. Dorico is co-founder of Future Roots Halifax, a so social enterprise employing young people ages 13 to 17 in Halifax North End. In 2016, Dorico began, began an annual campaign titled The Give Back to raise money for families across HRM who have difficulty providing a Christmas meal to their family. The Give Back in two years raised close to $6,000, provided meals to 55 families in HRM, and donated 65 kilograms of canned goods and 700 to feed Nova Scotia. Dorico um, received the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Century of Service Award, the Ruth and Irving Pink Award for Youth Development and Social Justice in 2019, uh, and he just received the Dr. Burnley Rocky Jones Human Rights Award for Nova Scotia Human Rights Commission. So very decorated, very deserving, and, uh, and just an all around awesome guy. And I couldn't be more happy to see Dorico joining us today. So Dorico is gonna to speak to you a little bit about his organization and point you to some initiatives that he's working on where we can all help. Um, so Dorico, if you wanna just introduce yourself and say hi to our guests, thanks for joining us. Don't worry, I'll, un I'll unmute you <laughs> somehow. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I was, I was trying to type that in the chat. <laughs> um, 
Well, I mean, uh, thanks for having me. Um, Matt, you could have just said, you know, we were friends and, and uh, you knew me for some time, but I certainly appreciate, um, you know, the introduction um, and uh, everyone taking their time uh, to, uh, to have me here. Um, and especially before, uh, you know, your amazing panel. Um, so uh, a little bit about ACE. Uh, so the acronyms, oh, is Lamia here? Lamia, yep. can we unmute Lamia as well? Yes, I can, yeah. Uh, just be a, a moment. Thanks for joining us, Lamia. We'll figure out how to unmute. I gotcha, there we, we go. Online festivals. Oh, try unmuting yourself now, Lamia. <laughs> okay, there, there go. we go. Okay. <laughs> I just kept pressing it and it kept going back and forth. Sorry about that. It was Hi. like locking a door at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Hi, nice to see everybody. Um, so both Lamia and I are going to just uh, share a little bit about uh, ACE, um, answer any questions uh, people may have, um, and, and sort of give information on uh, where you can connect with us uh, further after this. Um, so I'll just sort of start with a brief introduction around ACE. Um, and so ACE stands for Arts, uh, Culture, Community, and uh, Economics. And uh, ACE was founded uh, about a year ago now. Uh, we have 13 members who are all uh, community leaders. Some are politicians, um, professionals, entrepreneurs, uh, artists. Uh, and we all sort of, we came together together with the mindset of we want to uh, co collective impact is important to us and how can we collaborate with uh, others who you know may be in uh, particular industries and who can invest uh, for the betterment of uh, African Nova Scotian community uh, and betterment overall um, and so there's a, a number of different things and events uh, that we that we were collaborating on um, we were a partner with the National Black Canadian Summit um, we had a hidden art series where we profiled uh, local uh, local artists who are uh, on the come up um, and uh, give them a platform um, to, to showcase their talents. Um, we have a number of different uh, things on the go currently, um, but uh, I'll give it to Lamia to talk about uh, Five Black Halifax and as well as any other things to share with Ace. Yeah, so Buy Black Halifax is one of the initiatives that we created as a way to promote and highlight Black businesses in Halifax. And um, as a result of, of, of the um, amplific amplification of the um, Black Lives Matter movement and all of the you know, activity that we see in Halifax and all over the globe, really, um, we really wanted to be able to, to make it um, you know, not so much clear, but just to, to be able to kind of response with, with, the, with something that was going to be able to be in conversation with the general public about, you know, black business and enterprise. Um, and so the um, boxes went live last, um, this Wednesday actually. And I think we saw like a lot of support um, for those, for the boxes and, um, and that the boxes are highlighting um, local black businesses and so everyone who buys a box will have a little sampler uh, from those businesses to be introduced to those businesses so we're really excited to launch that and there's been so much hard work that went into it from our team um, and um, we have a lot of a social media campaign built around it so you can find that on our, our social media channels and stuff like that but um, I guess for me, I can kind of speak to it in a sense of like, you know, what it means for us to be, you know, black and, and in business right now. It's, it's, it's um, if you can imagine, like it's, a, it's a, um, a challenging time because, you know, we're dealing with all of the emotions and the, and a lot of the other, you know, things that come up around, you know, just the conversation being so amplified right now. It's great. Um, and, but we also really want to keep focused on what folks can do um, and so, you know, making it easy for folks to purchase, you know, merchandise, because sometimes it's really hard to know where the black businesses are in Halifax. And that's really what we want to be continuing to do is to promote and, and kind of make it that we're getting out there. And so that folks and even, you know, platforms like this, where we have a chance to come and speak. Um, so that's what ACE is really trying to do is just be really visible and, and um, very authentic in our voice and, and sharing, um, you know, some really tangible solutions to how we can be um, continuing to, to build representation, um, particularly in the, the um, food and beverage industry as well. So I think, you know, as artists, as, as 
folks who host and um, and I work in the local brewing um, um, sector. So it's it's how do we start to to bring ourselves out more into these discussions and get involved with conversations about craft beer and 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 distilleries and all that stuff. So. Um, yeah, we're very happy for the opportunity to collaborate with you guys and, and to be connected here. So thanks for having me and us and, um, and thank you for supporting ACE. Of course, and what we, the, sorry, go ahead, Dorico. There's one, just one, uh, one other thing I just want to add about yeah. ACE that I think it's important as well is that we, uh, like we're self, like we, all of the members pay into this. Um, like, so we're self-funded um, because we, you know, we, we, we believe in what we're doing um to the point that all of the members pay into it and all the initiatives that we do run from the money that we uh pay into it so it's a really grassroots uh community driven uh organization uh where folks and members um are not only morally socially but also financially uh, invested um, in our own work yeah i think that's fantastic and the more i learned about ace in the last week um i actually just purchased um, uh, a mask from Trev, it's beautiful. Um, uh, being able to, to find where um, we can help these black businesses and also just like, you know, Dorico, you were able to tell me substantially where this money would go, where sometimes with organizations, they're not sure, they don't have a clear vision where I think that your team has done an excellent job in, in articulating that vision and, and bringing that to, um, you know, to our, community. So I think that's amazing and something that we, we thought about as, as at Drink Atlantic when we sat down um, and started to have these discussions that we want to be able to help and um, not just in Halifax, but throughout all of Canada and the United States to see, you know, more BIPOC people behind the bar, owning bars, being at cocktail lounges and, and, and enjoying themselves. So creating these inclusive environments that we're, you know, we're celebrating all of our community members. Mm -hmm. So um, if you guys need, I just put in the chat where you can find uh, more information on ACE and Dorico is also really awesome at getting back to you. So if you reach out to him, I'm sure he can help if you need any questions to um, point you in the direction of where you can support best. Um, and um, Lamia, where can people find uh, a way to purchase one of those um, boxes? Um, we have a Facebook or a, a website, so um, I could just pull it up right now and put that in the chat as well. Uh, yeah, so I strongly encourage you guys to make a donation to help this this group. Um, um, personally connected to a number of the members there, and and Shaq and Bradley and and Dorico. So I'm I'm really I'm really happy to to help in a small way. And I know that it's just a, it's not going to be an answer like a full answer, but it's going to be something that can help. I think. So yeah, thank you for being here. I mean. Yeah, I think, you know, your support is, is greatly appreciated and, and folks even even listening, I think that, um, you know, uh, Matt, when we spoke, uh, like there's a larger conversation around um, getting uh, people of color behind the bar uh, and, in, and in the industry. And, you know, I think a good person to even connect with might be Lamia, unless she's working in the brewing industry. Um, and, and you know, to talk about like the larger sort of part around why isn't there um, people of color uh, in the industry and why are we underrepresented specifically uh, within that industry. And I think that, um, you know, a great starting place is here. Um, folks are connected uh, all around the world. Um, and, and, and I think it's a, um, a, a great step uh, in the right direction to diversify uh, the industry more, especially in Halifax. I can't speak for other parts of the world, uh, but especially Halifax. Yeah, we certainly have representation from all over the world here today. So, Dorico and Lamia, thank you so much, and thank you for the work that you're doing in our community. And um, never hesitate to reach out to the Clever Barkeep, to Drink Atlantic, to any of the, the founding members of Drink Atlantic. We're here to help and try to help change the conversation. So, really appreciate you being here again. Thank you. Thank you. Feel free to stick around and learn about some rum because we have a great panel um, representative of, you know, smaller craft all the way to larger commercial scale, um, some experts in the industry. And I'm going to introduce our moderator is uh, Charlene Rook, who is a WSET spirits educator and drink journalist, uh, current drinks editor of Food and Drink, the in-store magazine of the Liquor Control Board of Ontario, the LCBO for short. Um, she's a writer and panelist for Canada's 50 Best Bars, the lead judge of the Canadian Artisan Spirit Competition, 
and a distiller who trained at Moonshine University in Louisville, Kentucky. I've only known her for a very short period of time, but she's very organized, very well spoken. She helped edit my own, own description, so thank you so much. Uh, and I'd just like to pass it over to Charlene, who's who's tuning us in from all the way from Vancouver. So thank you. Welcome everybody. Thank you, Matt. Um, just before we start today's session, uh, I do want to acknowledge we're here today to celebrate rum, and particularly the tradition of rum on the East Coast. But it's important to acknowledge that we wouldn't have that tradition without some kind of unhappy history, because the rum industry is connected to what was once a plantation economy and the global slave trade as ships moved around the world from Africa to the Caribbean to the East Coast and back to the Southern Hemisphere. Um, you know, the reality of that history shouldn't diminish us being appreciative that we have a thriving rum industry today, but I think it's just important to acknowledge that before we start. So that said, uh, we have four amazing panelists today, and I'd welcome you to ask any questions using the chat while each panelist is speaking, or at the end, after our four panelists wrap up, there'll be a chance to ask questions that could be directed to all of them. Uh, so one by one, I'll just have them quickly introduce themselves with their names and their roles. Uh, first, I'll go to our panelist from Crosby's Molasses, which has been producing in St. John, New Brunswick since 1879. William? Hello, everybody. I'm William Crosby, so I'm the Director of Sales and Business Development here at Crosby Molasses Company. Um, so it's a, a fifth generation uh, family business. Um, so I'm a fifth generation molasses merchant. Uh, we've been importing and processing uh, and packaging fancy and blackstrap molasses here in Atlantic Canada for uh, over 140 years. This is our 141st year. Amazing. Uh, next up, we have our friends from Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, where they were really one of Canada's pioneer artisan distillers, I think since 2009. Is that right, Lynn and Pierre? Absolutely. Yep. In fact, this month we are celebrating our 10th anniversary in beautiful right. Lindenburg. And Ironworks is, uh, is uh, dedicated to producing spirits from the ground up. And Lynn's got a little prop here to, to reinforce what William was saying. Uh, Crosby <laughs> molasses is the basis for all of our rum. And we do all our fermenting, distilling, double distilling and aging on premises in Lindenburg. Great. Our third panelist is the new kid on the block. We have uh, Alex from Compass Distillers, which I think opened in Halifax 2017, is that right? That is correct, yeah. Um, so my name is Alex, I'm the head distiller at Compass. And uh, yeah, we've been here since 2017. Uh, we produce rum, of course, as well as gin and vodka and some other fun things too. Amazing. And our fourth panelist, uh, we're going to end where it all started, which is at Mount Gay, I believe the oldest existing commercial rum distillery in the world. Uh, right. This is its heritage back to 1703 in Barbados. Hi, everybody. My name is Raphael Grisoni. So I'm the managing director of Mount Gay for two years, uh, 12 years, sorry, now. And uh, enjoying life in Barbados. And uh, as you said, it's a beautiful uh, place where everything started as it's concerned rum, so many stories to share, of course. So this is going to give us a nice overview that fits really well with the approach that the Wine and Spirits Education Trust takes, because when we um, teach people about spirits, we like to talk about the production and how the different factors in how something's produced contributes to its quality. Uh, so it'll give us a nice overview of starting with the raw material, what small batch production looks like and large commercial production. So actually just before we start um, and go to our panelists, what I thought I'd do is just go through a tiny bit of the WSET approach and just give you a quick overview of uh, rum production, just as a review for those of you that aren't that familiar. Uh, everybody can see the slide, I think. Uh, this is what a sugarcane field looks like. Uh, Sugarcane, for anybody who hasn't seen it growing, is maybe a bit similar to the bamboo plant. It's a tall, woody, cane-type plant. And when you cut one open, you can sort of see that woody interior here. If anybody's been to a tropical country, sometimes they, um, they'll serve uh, cane on the streets as a little snack, and you can kind of chew on it. It has a lightly sweet taste. When you crush those canes, you get this type of a juice that we see here. 
which tastes lightly sweet, very grassy and herbaceous. That juice itself can be made into rum. The juice can be cooked into a syrup that can be made into rum, uh, or it can be crystallized into sugar and the byproduct molasses. All these things are raw materials that can be used for rum. So as you might guess, the definition for rum as a spirit is one that's uh, fermented and distilled from sugar cane or its byproducts. So that's unlike things like whiskey and vodka, which use maybe grains or potatoes or brandy, which uses fruits. Rum is made generally from sugarcane or its byproducts. So just to go through the basics of how that happens. Char Charlene, sorry to interrupt you, but I, are you trying to sh share your screen right now? Because it's not. Um... Oh, sorry. It's showing here that it's sharing. Okay. Yeah. Let me go back. Sorry about that, guys. Thanks for pointing that out. All good. This break is brought to you by the fine folks at WSET. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I'm getting the message that screen sharing is failing to start. So, okay. Descriptions are great. <laughs> um, tr tr try it. Um, we'll try it now. I mean, we can, uh, we can totally skip it. That's fine. John, can you just make the slides your background? I, 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 I can, um, but uh, she would have to send the, the slides to me. Oh, there you go. Ooh. Perfect. Are we good now? Nice. Yes. Nice. Sorry about that, guys. So that's the cane plant I was talking about. This is the idea of the woody canes and the cane juice. And then just do a quick run through of how rum is made. We would crush that sugar cane typically through a roller mill or something like that. And you'd have either the sugar cane juice that would be fermented or that cane juice could be turned into molasses and sugar, which are also raw materials that can be used for fermentation. Now fermentation is so important when we're making a spirit because you want to start with a sugary liquid add some yeast and ferment it, that's where the alcohol is created. So when we talk about a sugary liquid, sugarcane juice or syrup or molasses is simply perfect because it starts as a sugary liquid. And when that's fermented, we end up with lovely alcohol that we can then distill to get a spirit of the strength that we're used to drinking. So if you've been to a distillery, you've probably seen something that looks like these, uh, actually right in the background there, we see one at Compass. Uh, either a pot still or a column still are a couple of ways that that fermented alcoholic liquid can be distilled into a spirit. Uh, the spirit would then be typically rested, maybe in a stainless steel tank like we see here, or perhaps in a wooden container like an oak barrel is very typical. And then after it's been matured or rested, a number of things could happen before it's bottled and sold, which could include uh, water being added to bring it to an appropriate strength. Uh, it can be sweetened. Uh, color is sometimes added, uh, something we call caramel coloring in the industry, which is not a caramel flavor. It's more like a brown food coloring. Uh, sometimes color is also removed. So when the rum rests in wooden barrels in particular, it can take on a golden color. Sometimes that's not desirable and it actually be stripped out with charcoal aging so you have a nice clear white rum. Um, so when you cut sugar cane and crush that juice, it's quite a perishable product. Sugar cane within a couple of hours of being cut starts, the sugar content starts to go down. Um, so we often see uh, sugar cane juice being produced into sugar and molasses or rum being produced right in those tropical countries where sugar cane is grown. And by the way, cane is not a native plant. Um, I believe history tells us that Christopher Columbus brought sugar cane plants to the West Indies around 1492. And we have this sort of legacy of it growing in warm tropical areas around the region. So you'll see everywhere from the Caribbean down to these uh, French islands of uh, Guadeloupe and Martinique, where we have a style of rum being produced called rum agricole. That's the type that's produced directly from the sugarcane juice, all the way down to South America. And in Brazil, we have a type of uh, cane spirit there, cachaça, which is their equivalent of rum. 
So it's being produced all throughout the region. And as we know, on the eastern seaboard of the United States, all over Canada, and craft distillers all around the world making rum. Now, the interesting thing with rum is that each rum producing region or country tends to have its own labeling conventions. Um, so when we talk about styles of rum, you know, the older convention would have been to talk about sort of from left to right here, white rum, a gold or amber rum, dark rum, and then we have a rum agricole, a cachaca, and a navy style or overproof rum. Uh, at the WSCT, we're finding that that kind of a classification is a little bit uh, less useful than it used to be because coloring can be adjusted so easily. So we sort of see rum producers moving toward a system a bit more like we're used to with whiskey for classifying it and label terms that will maybe refer more to how it's actually produced. Is it a pot still or a column still rum? Is it from a single distillery or is it a multi-island or multi-distillery blend? that kind of thing. Um, because we do have some craft producers today, I thought I'd just mention with Canadian craft spirits, uh, in Canada, because liquor is regulated on a province by province basis, the rules for craft are quite different. So where I am in British Columbia, for instance, we don't have any craft rums made of molasses because in British Columbia, craft spirits have to use 100% local agricultural products. And we don't really grow sugarcane here. We couldn't even use, if we were fortunate enough to have a commercial plant like a Crosby's Molasses, craft producers couldn't use that and keep their craft license because it's not local agriculture. So we have a number of these rum type spirits made from honey in British Columbia. And you notice they're called things like honeycomb moonshine, honey shine, rum spelled very creatively, R-H-U-M-B. Uh, the one on the, on the uh, far right of the slide, I should point out, is actually an uh, agricultural style sugarcane juice rum that is made by a very clever distiller in the interior of BC who grew some sugarcane in a greenhouse. And that requires real dedication. <laughs> uh, also, just because we are uh, talking about Drink Atlantic, I thought I'd mention a couple of interesting flavored rums coming out of the craft scene. These are from Newfoundland Distillery Company. These both have won awards at the San Francisco International Spirit Competition, uh, flavored with things like honey and chaga, which is a kind of uh, mushroom pet fungus. And even this sort of gunpowder and rose, your guns and roses rum, if you like, that's actually a Jamaican rum flavored with things like kelp, sea salt, birch, and rose. And then just because we're talking about the Atlantic, of course, we have to mention screech, <laughs> which is a very unique, Newfoundland ritual actually is Jamaican rum as well. So I'm going to turn it over to William to talk about molasses. Uh, if you like this flavor of the WSET approach, uh, I would invite you to look on the WSET website. There's a course finder there that will let you find uh, where you could take a wine, spirit, sake, or soon to be offering beer courses close to you. The WSET is in more than 70 countries, has more than 800 providers offering courses. And we've got all the social media channels there as well. If you'd like to contact me after the session about anything, you can just look at my website and there's an email link there. And the school that I teach for out of Vancouver is Tatera Academy. So I've got that for you there too. So I, I just want to say one thing, sorry to interrupt. If you are, if you are uh, on here and you're a Canadian Professional Bartenders Association member and it's easy to sign up, you do get a discount at Satera, just so you know. Thanks, John. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to William now to talk about the raw material of molasses, a bit about his company and its relationship to rum, rum distillation and how his product in particular is being used by some distillers. All right, so uh, I guess I'll start you off with uh, a brief history of our company. Um, so the company was started in 1879 by my great great grandfather Lorenzo George Crosby. Um, his father had a, a general store in Yarmouth, Nova Scotia, and he actually started an uh, import export business out of his father's store where he was shipping fish and lumber down to the Caribbean. And then rather than bring back the ships empty, he started bringing back barrels of molasses. And that actually became the more lucrative business. So he broke out of his father's store and started the, uh, the Crosby Molasses Company. Um, 
So after a few years in, in Yarmouth, uh, he actually moved the company to St. John, New Brunswick. Uh, to take advantage of the, the bustling port at the time. So that would have been in around 1890. Um, and we've actually been in the same location here um, on Rossay Avenue since 1910. Um, so over the years, um, you know, we've diversified our, our product offering a little bit, but molasses really still is uh, more than 50% of our business. Um, and over the years, we also acquired um, some of our competitors. So Dominion Molasses Company would have been our main competitor um, based out of Nova Scotia. We would have acquired them in, in around 1981. Um, and then we acquired our other major competitor that was based in, in Quebec, uh, Grandma Molasses in 1997. So we're now kind of like the, the leading molasses provider in Canada for, for retail, um, but then also for uh, industrial or commercial use. Um, so that's, that's really uh, the history of our, our company um, and we import two types of molasses. So fancy molasses, which is the, the highest grade of uh, molasses available, uh, would be about 70% of, of what we bring in. Uh, the other 30% uh, would be blackstrap molasses, um, which is a, a byproduct of the sugar milling or sugar refining process. Uh, and the vast majority of that that we do bring in actually ends up in animal feed um, or uh, for other industrial uses um, like cookies and breads and, and, uh, and barbecue sauces. William, what are the difference in the flavors between those two? If a distiller was using fancy versus blackstrap, how would the flavor profile of the finished rum differ based on that raw material? Yeah, so fancy molasses, um, like I said, it's the, the highest uh, grade um, available. So it's, it's made directly from cane juice. Um, so the cane juice is crushed uh, and then they invert it right into a, a syrup at that point. So it's kind of like the extra virgin olive oil of the molasses world. Um, so it's lighter in color um, and higher in sugar. Um, so it would typically give you sort of a, a cleaner, smoother uh, tasting spirit, I would say. Um, blackstrap molasses, since it's a byproduct in sugar refining, it, it contains a lot of those uh, trace minerals or, or non-sucrose uh, elements of the cane. Um, so it's much more earthy in flavor, almost bitter. Um, so as a result, if you're using that in distilling, you get a, a bit more of a, a harsher, um, metallic-y kind of earthy tasting spirit. And what countries do those two products come from? So we source from Guatemala exclusively um, now, um, but for the first 112 years of uh, our company's history, we were importing exclusively from Barbados. Um, but the, we were buying from a company called uh, the Barbados Fancy Molasses Company. Um, but they would have closed down in, in the early 90s um, just due to the fact that there was a lot of small sugar mills on, on the island um, and the land became more valuable for you know, condos and hotel developments. So it was tough for them to compete uh, with some of the big global sugar producers. Um, so after the industry shut down there, we kind of shopped around a bit looking for uh, another sort of you know, quality high test molasses. Uh, so we, we bought a little bit from Belize and, and Brazil and Dominican, and then ultimately landed on this mill in Guatemala that we've been sourcing from exclusively for more than 20 years now. And William, maybe you could just tell the viewers um, how Crosby's has been related to distillation over the years. Yeah, so um, Atlantic Canada obviously has a, a long rum tradition. Um, we've been, uh, I would say, a, a preferred uh, supplier to the home distiller in uh, certain regions of uh, Nova Scotia and PEI for, for a long time. We, we noticed, um, you know, in, in areas like uh, Cape Breton and, and PEI that we sell a lot of our gallon jugs, which are a 5 kg jug. I actually dug up this newspaper article here from uh, 1995 in which there was a raid on uh, on a home distilling operation, and the, the police officers here, here is pulling out one of our 
<laughs> five kg jugs. Um, so there's been a, a long uh, history of, of, I guess, bootleggers or home distillers using our product. Um, there also used to be some really big um, distillery operations here in Atlantic Canada that we used to supply thousands of tons to. Um, so there was a Captain Morgan uh, distillery in Rishabucko, uh, which would have closed down in, in the 80s uh, when they changed the aging requirements. Um, and then there was also another big uh, distillery in Bridgetown, Nova Scotia, which was called Arcadian Distillery. Um, and uh, that also would have closed down, I believe, in 1986. So that's really when, um, when the big distillers kind of halted their operations in Atlantic Canada. And since then, uh, you know, in, in 2009, 2010, when, when craft distilleries started popping up, like, like Ironworks, um, we started selling into that channel. Um, so now um, we supplied dozens of, uh, of craft distilleries across Canada and, and into the U.S. as well. Cool. If anyone's quite interested in this tradition of uh, illicit booze trade and rum runners and that kind of thing, uh, there was a session uh, done, one of the spirited sessions on the Sovereign Wine and Spirits YouTube channel called Taverns Trade and Temperance in the Canadian Maritimes, which taps into some of that illicit history and is worth a watch. Okay, uh, William, unless you have anything to add, I think we'll move directly on to your friends at Ironworks. As Lynn said, an awful lot of Crosby's molasses has passed through there in the last 10 years. Yes, can I tell you a secret? Please do. We weren't going to make rum. It seems a bit sinful to be saying that, but when we first started the distillery, actually, it was our intention to use the fruit in the province to make fruit brandies um, and we make our vodka from apples etc but somebody pointed out to us very soon after we arrived in Lunenburg that rum was a really important element of this world so um, that's when we realized that Crosby's was right across the bay and decided to start bringing in Crosby's molasses and you can talk about the fermentation. Well, the process as uh, Charlene described is very similar to what we do here using the the fine fancy grade molasses from Crosby's. Um, the difference is that we do, we tend to ferment a little longer than the larger producers. One of the joys of being a small producer is that, a craft producer, is that you can, you can change up how you're doing things, you can do a lot more testing, experimenting, and so on, and uh, rather than trying to always produce a, a standard, consistent, large-scale uh, process uh, product. So we've been doing that along. Fermentation tends to be a little longer. We have a delightful wood-fired uh, 220 liter still that most of our rum has been made in. Um, and uh, so those are a couple of, of production differences that, that we, uh, we, we do. And then we have played with the aging process considerably in the variety of products that we do. So I thought w the best thing for us to do is talk about the individual products and what makes them different and why we keep trying to uh, come out with new rums all the time. And Lynn's Perfect. going to start with talking about uh, the Blue Nose rum. Just before Lynn does that, Pierre, can you just tell our viewers why the longer fermentation is important in rum? Rum is a spirit where, where long fermentations can be particularly important. I think it's just worth saying why. Um, I think you could probably explain that better than I can. <laughs> um, it boils down to creating some, some unique flavors. The longer you let that fermentation go, you're going to get some funky kind of flavors developing, which we really count on in rum to give it an interesting flavor profile. So that's why the long fermentation is, is sort of interesting. There. Yeah. In our case, a lot of it had to do with the size of our building, the size of our fermentation containers, the size of this relatively smaller size of our still and the turnover. And uh, mm -hmm. so that was that. And the, the, the fact that we don't actually heat the room in which the fermentation takes place, nor do we cool the fermentation. So a lot of it was, was by chance and by necessity in our limited space building. So let, let's start with the, the variety of rums that we do. This right. first rum is the Blue Nose. And it's kind of our signature best-selling product. 
Uh, the Blue Nose, as I was saying earlier, is celebrating its 100th anniversary, uh, and it was built right down the street from us in Lunenburg. Um, we did this rum to celebrate the rebuilding of the Blue Nose 2, which was built about 100 yards down the street from us. And uh, I have a small sample that uh, Lynn is going to try and then talk about the distinguishing features of it. But the thing about this rum that we're very proud of is in 2014, it won the, an award as the world's best dark rum at the World Rum Awards in London in the UK. Amazing. Against Pusser's rum, believe it or not. And um, many others. This was actually go not going to be a permanent product. Um, it was created in the summer of 2012 because of the refit of Blue Nose 2, um, but it became so popular that we, we kept it. Um, in this industry, you actually have to go out and purchase alcohol to do your research. It's part of the job. Um, so we sampled a number of dark rums to see which one we wanted to emulate. Um, we found many of them overly sweet, but that tends to be what we shy away from anyway. Um, so the, the Blue Nose that we ended up coming out with has a modest amount of molasses added back into it to create this lovely dark red black color um, and two spices, only two spices. Um, it's a very simple uh, infusion that we do before we actually um, put, it, uh, put it together and people seem to like it. So here it is. Oh. I'm supposed to talk about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, it's a hard job, but someone has to do it. Um, people really like the fact that it's very rich and full. And uh, I, I find it quite sweet, but for those who like sweet, sweet rum, that's an appropriate thing. Moving right along. How long is that have, one matured? How long is it matured? Only about a year. Okay. That's a, that's a minimum maturation. You have to keep it in the barrel for a year. Exactly. And Blue Nose is one of the basic ones. So it, after a year comes out and we blend it with the, uh, down to the four, to 42% um, and then add the molasses and the spices. Okay. Okay. So. So the second one we wanted to talk about is barrel, we call Barrel 97. It's an amber rum of ours and it probably is one of our most favorite ambers we've ever produced. This was six and a half years in the barrel and the barrel was unique and part of the experimentations that we're doing. It was a wine barrel, a, a, a pre-used red wine barrel from Blomidon Estates in the valley. Yeah, um, Blomidon had used it for two previous red wines um, and the color of the rum when it came out of the barrel was, this is completely its own color. Um, it was a nice rosy amber and the nature of, of, this, of aging rum in, in a red wine barrel is that it gives it a really nice, almost an additional fruity taste. Oh, God, that's the wrong thing. <laughs> hmm. Woman who loves her work. Oh, here's, the, here's the thing about tasting, tasting spirits. You're doing it a really good favor if you taste it at room temperature. Um, and some people find that difficult, but it is worth doing because you will get so much more from the spirit than you will if you add too much ice, et cetera, to it. And here, the second sip will always be better than the first, trust me on that one. What's our next one? Ah, okay. So there was this time when Pierre started fantasizing about a boat. He said, we need a boat. Why do we need a boat, I say to him. He says, because we need to age rum on a boat. We are in Lunenburg, after all, we have to uh, take advantage of the fact that we're right next to the ocean. So we got a sad old fishing boat and retrofitted it to be a floating rum warehouse. And there is the result. Rum boat, rum. Do you want to tell them more about that? So about 300 yards from where we're sitting out in the middle of Lunenburg Harbor all year long, 365 days, that boat rocks in the North Atlantic waves uh, with about 25 or 30 barrels of rum, some whiskey and some brandy, but that's another story on it. And uh, it, it has become a local tourist attraction. All of the tour boats going out of Lunenburg Harbor and back in stop by the rum boat. It's the ugliest barge of a boat you've ever seen, which uh, Lynn has named Black Beauty. Um, and uh, we really felt that, that we wanted to take advantage of Lunenburg's position vis-a-vis -vis the ocean, the history, et cetera, the shipbuilding. And uh, we thought that was a perfect way to, to reflect what it is we do. So exciting, my next. 
this rum has a very interesting flavor and there's no way, other way to describe it than lively. I don't know what WSET would call lively, but this, you can taste the fact that it's not stationary when it's, when it's aging. And I'm not quite sure why, but it is the case. It is a blend. The, the, the rum is, is from three to five years old by now, I would imagine. Um, and we, so there's no specific vintage on it. It's not, we're not going to be able to say this is five years or two years or three years, um, but it is definitely um, a lovely tasting, lots of good fruitiness to it. And the, the accentuated uh, flavors that you get from barrel aging um, are particularly pronounced in this, in this rum. So. And it's a combination of new oak and used bourbon barrels. Mm. All right. Where do I go now? Nautical theme, continue. Oh, the nautical theme. Oh, the big one? Yeah. Woo! All right. Another boat dream. Go. So this was, again, a result of us focusing upon uh, the, the ocean environment in Lunenburg, the history of Lunenburg. Out of Lunenburg sails a tall ship which does regular voyages around the world as kind of a training ship. And we one day went to them and said, hey, would you mind taking a barrel of rum on your next trip around the world? Well, they loved the idea and they took four barrels with them. And this product is the result of that. First of all, the packaging, the, the box has been designed by a local uh, designer here. It's got the entire uh, ship uh, itinerary around the world. And then there's the bottle. This bottle was designed by a ceramic artist in Lunenburg and then built in a 250 year old porcelain factory in France. And you can certainly see from the shadows on the bottle uh, where that design is coming from and what it reflects. It's a beautiful ship and it, it is stated quite simply in the bottle. It, um, it actually very strongly resembles the silhouette of Picton Castle, which is the main reason we chose this particular bottle. Um, yeah, it's a pretty one. And we're not gonna sample this one, but I will tell you about it. Um, aging rum in Lunenburg is way different from aging rum in the Caribbean. Um, the elements that are going to be pulled out of rum by virtue of it being in, in the, the heat and the humidity of the Caribbean is very different from the profile you're going to get in, in Lunenburg, which is frankly great. I mean, Lunenburg rum has a certain terroir, if you, if you will. But we found when this rum arrived back, and I remember tasting it first down on the dock just after they'd arrived, um, and the cook, who was, who was one of the, the chaps who'd gone all the way around the world, who I think he was from the Car he was from Car Caribbean, um, he tasted it and decided that it was quite delicious and commented on the fruit, fruitiness of it. So it has a, a bit of a tropical element that we never get in our Lunenburg rum, which is kind of fun. Great. So I think that that has taken up our entire 10 yes. minutes. So Charlene, we will pass it back to you. Perfect. And if any of our guests have questions for you at the end, we'll come back to you. But I think that's a nice transition now to Alex at Compass, which as kind of the new kid on the craft distilling block in Halifax is still in kind of that process of experimentation like Ironworks might have been a decade ago, figuring out what works in your distillery, what your signature products will be, what you'll do as a limited edition and what you'll continue to put on the shelves. And Alex is also going to address a really particular kind of maturation they do and how that taps into one of the big historical traditions of rum as well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, so my, again, I'm Alex uh, from Compass and thank you so much for asking me to be on this panel. Um, so yeah, you know, I feel it's really cool to follow Crosby's and then Ironworks, given that, um, yeah, we're three years old and we're still, uh, I'm still in the uh, big experimentation phase of rum production here at Compass. And uh, in our first year, we spent a lot of time working with uh, a mixture of molasses, uh, fancy molasses and sugar for our rum ferments and uh, aging in small-ish new oak barrels. And um, then in the rum that I was working on last year, I sort of started to experiment a lot with um, fermentation and mixing yeasts and uh, playing with different fermentables. Um, one large batch of another molasses and sugar 
um, run and then a secondary experiment with just all organic cane sugar and then a different kind of yeast uh, as well. And it's been really, really interesting to kind of see just how different uh, the flavors are. And uh, it's been really, really fun. The, uh, one of the sugarcane rums that I produced last year, I took a sample of a little while ago, and the aromatics uh, like actually blew me away. It was like so, so uh, interesting. I'm gonna leave it for a while yet, but uh, I'm pretty pumped at how it's turning out. And uh, so to kind of talk about what we do here is actually Compass, we produce everything from scratch. So um, as much as possible, we try to use um, Nova Scotian agricultural products, which you know we obviously can't do with, uh, with rum, but uh, we do use Crosby's molasses as much as possible. And I'm probably gonna start making rum either next week or the week after. And I think this year I'm gonna experiment more with uh, a heavier uh, percentage of fancy molasses uh, just because I wanna see how that turns out. And um, generally we, yeah, um, I've been playing around with like hotter, quicker ferments and then uh, colder, longer ferments and just making a lot of notes and observing the differences and uh, basically trying to determine which methods work best in our environment and in with our equipment to produce like a really nice complex uh, and aromatic and flavorful rum with a lot of esters. And so in the fermentation, um, yeast basically they pr pr produce a lot of really cool flavor uh, depending on the types of yeast and the, the fermentation technique. And then in the distillation, which happens in our still here, we've got a hybrid Vendome still. Uh, we can produce a lot of uh, sort of like further esterification through like the distillation process. And then that also further changes and matures in the barrels. And so um, with some rums that uh, we produce here, uh, pardon me, it's really warm here today. Um, I've had like a bit of like very, very estery rums that uh, I was a little concerned about when they first came off the still, but they've actually become quite, quite interesting and complex uh, after a period of aging. And that's uh, basically due to the interactions with like those esters and the barrel and the, and the char kind of creating a really cool complex flavor. So um, yeah, I'm really, really interested in continuing to experiment and seeing what kind of cool things I can come up with and uh, just always modify our techniques. It's, uh, it's kind of the fun part of being a small craft distiller is that, you know, uh, you've got all this opportunity to experiment with, uh, with what you're doing. And, you know, not everything has to be completely rigid and set in stone as Lynn and Pierre kind of alluded to in their first, uh, first few years of production. And even with the things that they're doing now with uh, the maturation, which is really cool. Uh, so on Alex, speaking of maturation, tell us a bit about your daily ration product and how that has a really unusual maturation story. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, one of our rums that we're selling right now is uh, called the Daily Ration Rum, which is actually a rum that we age at the Halifax Citadel, which is about four blocks down the road from uh, Compass. And uh, it's really interesting that we have uh, all of, well, a large portion of our barrels aging at the Citadel right now, which is... Um, in a North magazine in an old munitions room, which is dark and kind of cold and damp, which actually is like the complete opposite of what you would expect uh, rum to be aged in in the Caribbean. And it actually kind of uh, is really, really cool in my opinion, not only for the historical connection to, you know, uh, people in the British Navy and people uh, even in the Canadian Navy having like a daily rum ration up until like the 1970s in Canada, uh, it's also like probably one of the oldest rooms, <coughs> uh, which is really, really interesting. And um, I think it kind of, you know, given that Nova Scotia is warm and cold and damp and foggy, uh, it's an interesting way to kind of play into the, the sort of terroir aspect of like creating an authentic rum in the east coast of Canada, like in, in the northern hemisphere. It's, uh, it's a fun experiment there too. Great. Uh, anything else you want to add, Alex? Otherwise, we'll go back to where it all began and ask Raphael at Mount Gay to talk a bit about how large-scale commercial production differs a bit from what we've heard about from both of you. Uh, I would love to hear about that. So, uh, Great. Yeah. And again, any questions, feel free to send them through to the chat, either when all the panelists are done or any time you have a thought. 
So, uh, Raphael, if you could just tell us a bit about the rum tradition and style yep. in Barbados, and particularly yep. touch on that Caribbean maturation, which I think is an interesting piece. Sure, of course. Uh, the good thing is that the process is the same, in fact. Uh, all uh, our guests describe, uh, we are doing exactly the same way uh, in Barbados. Just a, a few words on, on Mongay specifically. Spe Mongay so started... Uh, in fact, in the 1600, and effectively, we have some documents. We are the oldest from distillery in the world, but we were a plantation uh, distillery till the 1920s. Uh, so we were really having uh, the, the, the sugar cane plantation. We were distilling our own um, fermenting, sorry, and distilling our own mol molasses uh, because we were uh, producing sugar back then. And in the 20s, because of the demand of, uh, and it's funny, uh, of the uh, the, the rum and spirit, generally speaking, due to prohibition, uh, Monge start to invest in, uh, in, in uh, column steel, so in a uh, coffee steel that we still have, and, uh, and we started uh, to change scale. So talking about scale, it really, in fact, in, in, the, in the history of, of Monge, we are talking about 100 years ago, which is uh, on the scale of history of rum, it's quite recent for us. So just to put back uh, in perspective. So Barbados, yeah, it's, the, the style of Barbados, I think there's really a style of Barbados, and there's this um, uh, tradition of having a quite balanced rum. So we are effectively distilling in, in column steel, uh, and we are also, we have those uh, traditional pot steel. At Monge, we have two kinds of pot steel. We have uh, Macmillan pot steel, so very uh, Scottish uh, pot steel uh, on, on the heavy side uh, of things. And we have a Spanish uh, called Fragasa uh, pot steel, which are on the medium body uh, style. So. Really, what makes the, the Barbados rum and there's four distilleries uh, on, on the island, what makes really the style of Barbados is the balance. So the combination and the blending of uh, column steel and, and pot steel, at least in the, the last uh, hundred and something, uh, something years. So what makes also the, the thing specific, and we're talking about uh, aging, the aging process, it's true that uh, in the tropical latitude, we have an extreme line, and uh, somebody mentioned it, but we have very high temperature. I mean, right now uh, it's 32 degrees uh, Celsius. We have uh, high humidity right now. So it's, uh, we started uh, recently the hurricane season, so quite humid, lots of, of rain. So you have humidity between 85 and to 96% humidity. So of course the woods are, operating so it's it's true that uh, in europe or probably in canada when you have differential of temperature and humidity uh, the, the the wood is opening and, and closing opening and closing so you have a certain uh, work happening in the barrel here in barbados now we have kind of constant even if you have fluctuation and that uh, something we are we like to track also in our in our cellars you have difference of uh, temperature and humidity but evaporation or what we call the angel share uh, the first five years, we are losing like, well, losing 11 to 12% a year uh, during wow. the five first years, so which is huge. Um, and of course, we are, we don't touch the barrel, so we, we, we fill in uh, our barrels and uh, we leave it there. And after five years, we are checking the levels, etc. and all uh, evolve the, the, the rub. But it's true that it's one particularity probably of uh, aging or maturing. I prefer to say mature because as humans, rum, you know, it's not because you're old that you're necessarily mature. And all depend, of course, of the quality of the liquid. So out of the firm and uh, you're right uh, all to say that fermentation is a very important step in the creation of flavors. And at Monge, we are using uh, for six years now our own uh, proprietary yeast coming from our plantation. Uh, and we are reproducing, we selected a, a yeast strain that uh, we love and that is doing a great job in transforming uh, the sugar into alcohol. Um, and uh, that is one of the signature also of Monge. So we have our or signature yeast, which is giving really a style, like in, in wines, huh? you have off the shelf, um, uh, some off the shelf uh, yeast, and, uh, and you have some more proprietary yeast that effectively are, are helping to, uh, to have a, a strong identity in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, uh, flavor. So effectively, fermentation is where everything is happening. We have two types of fermentation. We have a, a more, um, what is fueling our colon, so are, are more, uh, uh, close um, vats and uh, temperature control. We are uh, talking about uh, temperature, so controlling the temperature and uh, the activity of the yeast. And we have the more traditional open vat, wooden vat, uh, oak vat, uh, beautiful, 
open that so because we have our traditional our own yeast but we have also we like to have the impact of the environment and Lynn I think you mentioned terroir but I believe in terroir I'm strong because maybe I'm French also nobody's perfect but I strongly believe in terroir and also in, in, in spirits and I will elaborate a bit on that but we like to have the influence of our direct environment. So we are in the middle, really, of the sugarcane fields in the, in the north of uh, the island, in the, in the parish of uh, St. Lucie, in the north of the island of Barbados. And yes, we, you have all the, the, the natural and wild yeast. You have also some bacteria. And I like, uh, and you said it, uh, uh, long fermentation. So our traditional fermentation is uh, 70, 72 hours. But on, on, on open vats and wooden vats can go further. So from 72 to uh, a week. Uh, recently, we did uh, uh, one month fermentation. I mean, it's uh, very peculiar, very specific. And when you go in the the fermentation room, uh, uh, the smells are quite uh, special. But after, yeah, you you you're distilling and you have a certain profile. We like to also to have some time for for um, research and development. But I think it's uh, very important to dedicate time to experiment. I think uh, it's true that we have some marks. I will say so. We have uh, uh, three type of column steel. Uh, we have two type of uh, of uh, of pot steel. So. That are the fixed mark, but we leave also room for experimentation. Could be on the fermentation time, could be on the on the cuts also, or we cut at distillation time, etc. So we leave room for that because it's so important, and it's all also allow us to uh, uh, to, uh, to 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 then release some limited edition and, and nice uh, product. So one also of the signature of Mongay, it's the uh, in terms of aging or maturation, is the kind of food. So we have three core uh, barrels that we are using. Uh, two with uh, American oak, so ex bourbon barrel, so A grade, so right uh, after uh, bourbon usage, they are coming to us and uh, Tennessee whiskey, so that are the American oak. And we have, and because, uh, as you know, uh, we belong to the Remy uh, Cointreau family for, uh, since uh, 1989 now, so uh, we are using uh, cognac barrel. And we have a great access to, uh, to barrels. That is also a luck to belong to a, a nice uh, little group. Uh, we have uh, access to nice barrels coming from cognac because these are the core free barrels we are using, but also other experimental barrels. Um, one of our sister distillery is Brooklady in Isla uh, in Scotland, and, and we are doing a lot of bartering of, 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 um, of barrels, yeah, which is uh, unlike we did two years ago where we, uh, um, we finished one of our EXO, so EXO, uh, one of the higher grades that, that we have, which is a, a blend between eight and, and 15 years old, uh, uh, Colon and pot steel, mainly in, in bourbon. We finished it uh, in, um, in Port Charlotte, so which is a, a whiskey, which is a, a highly pitted uh, whiskey. And so we developed, uh, well, it was just a limited edition, but it was interesting to explore what could be uh, new um, aromas or flavors that you can have uh, uh, in, in Europe. Um, and one thing, last thing that I would like, so the, the free core barrels and of course exploratory barrels, um, like uh, you will see soon, uh, I guess, uh, in October, we are going to release uh, something uh, age uh, in uh, port, uh, Tony Port uh, cask. Uh, we have sherry cask. I mean, we, we have plenty of cask and uh, different woods also. Uh, we can use uh, oak is the traditional wood uh, in the wine and spirit industry because it's available uh, and it's quite... Um, the property of oak are fantastic and specifically on the vanilla taste, of course, the vanillin taste is quite interesting. But not only, we have acacia wood and we have exploring some uh, uh, chestnut wood, etc. So we have, uh, yeah, we, we leave room for exploration too. Another point I, I wanted to, uh, to add, Charlene, because I had the feeling, and it's not to be mean or whatever, but on your presentation, I would like uh, or people following us today, uh, to take out the idea that because uh, rum uh, is made from sugarcane uh, byproduct, it's necessarily sweet. It's not the case. Uh, right. at, at fermentation level, you're transforming all sugars into alcohol. Right. So oh, there, there, there's maybe some trace then, but I would like uh, people really, because, um, and as you know, you should know that right now we are debating within the four distilleries in Barbados about uh, the Barbados rum GI. 
And really and truly, rum is a dry spirit. Out of the steel, it's super dry. Effectively, when you are aging, you have the, 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 the sap of the oak that I could be a, a burn or charred. You have a, a kind of rondness, but traces of sugar. It's, there's no really, it's not a sweet spirit. It's like a, a whiskey or whatever. I mean, uh, we are talking all spirits are naturally dry. And then it depends on the work that you are doing on it. Uh, through effectively the, 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 the maturation process or through adjunction and we, you were talking uh, linear year about uh, a beautiful product where you're adding molasses in it it's something which is added but naturally I would like because there's perception uh, I'm always um, interacting with people say oh yeah but rum is not for me because it's sweet no it's not sweet uh, rum is dry and then effectively there's there's uh, you said it there's different portfolio you can have spice rum where there are some uh, flavors are added and some sugar uh, you, you have flavor rum where it's purely uh, flavored etc uh, more on the low end and you, and you have uh, other rums which have uh, all, all flavor coming from the fermentation process from the distillation process from the maturation process the kind of food the blending also expertise uh, so I just wanted to just to sorry uh, but just to because we talk about about sweetness yes molasses is sweet of course <laughs> sugarcane when you chew it it's sweet of course but uh, uh, not rum actually yeah and it's important that's why we add that little bit about post distillation operations sweetening yeah. being one of them it's yeah. very very common for sweetener to be added to rum after maturation and before bottling uh, there are a few websites you can look at that break down the grams per liter of sugar in rum. And some of them are absolutely shocking. There are some very popular okay. rums that have 30 to 40 grams per liter of sugar. Exactly. exactly. About one third of what you get in a can of Coca-Cola. It's really significant. And there, yeah, there are sure. other rums that drink relatively dry. And I believe that is the growing trend to recognize that real terroir or the flavors of a rum either by the sugarcane varietal or the provenance of the cane or the molasses and that drink fairly dry rather than all we taste is, is sweetness and artificial flavor. Exactly. Yep. Excellent point. That uh, is an absolutely shocking angel share of 12%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it's, uh, it's why also uh, we are fighting to, in terms of education, to make understand what is the process. I mean, making rum, it's, it's expensive. Uh, yeah. And also uh, because it's uh, all manual, it's uh, uh, like you guys. I mean, it, the scale is changing, but it's <laughs> I mean, it's people. I mean, it's people uh, at fermentation behind the steel to make the cuts. Etc. It's really people, and of course all the the manipulation, and of course the the the, the loss the loss of uh, due to air operation. Plus in Barbados, so uh, I mean we don't have uh, free energy or cheap energy, so energy is imported. So there's a cost. Molasses, so the molasses is coming, uh, uh, basically the supply of Barbados, uh, and you said it, um, there's a reduction of uh, availability of molasses uh, because the, 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 the price of sugar worldwide is going, is going down and you have less and less people interested, in fact, uh, in, um, in producing sugar and hence uh, molasses. So still we, are, uh, we have a supply with local molasses I mean, all the molasses, and I'm not uh, uh, surprised that you cannot find Barbados molasses because we are all using it. We need it. So, uh, uh, sorry for our friend, uh, but yeah. you cannot supply your fancy molasses anymore from Barbados. But yeah, we are using all molasses uh, for, for, for rum purpose. And right now, within the industry, uh, it's between 10 and 15% of what we uh, use. When we are using all the Barbados molasses is, is um, what we do, and then the rest is imported. We used to import a lot from Guyana, which is uh, close to us, uh, but now it's mainly Guatemala and Dominican Republic are the, the two main suppliers of uh, molasses because they are still exporting so and uh, in quality. At Mongay, we are using also, on the top of that, we are using our own uh, plantation molasses. So we are lucky we, have, um, we still have a, a small estate, uh, a little bit less than 400 acres, uh, planted with different uh, sugarcane uh, varietal or cultivars. And uh, there's one mill actually in, on the island which is transforming uh, sugarcane into sugar and molasses. So we are lucky because what we are asking is to be the last uh, estate to be uh, milled. And so we 
get back our own molasses, which is coming from our estate, which is important for us. And, uh, and maybe next year at the same time, I will talk about uh, another project we are working on, which is quite interesting also on the terroir side and agricultural side, because uh, this is also very important for us, all the uh, biodiversity on the plantation and um, uh, so on sugarcane, but uh, also what we are planting in terms of trees, uh, fruit trees. I liked what you mentioned on bees because uh, we have also a, a nice apiary with uh, like 15 and plus uh, beehives. So it's something that uh, we cherish too. Yeah. So we try to maintain this ecosystem, which is quite important from the origin of Mongay, which was really uh, yeah, a plantation distillery. Yes, we have a, a, a nice commercial growth probably in the, uh, in the 70s, 80s uh, with a, a nice scale, but uh, we keep those things because it's important to maintain the tradition of Rome, uh, uh, making sure that uh, our staff also is trained properly on uh, and, and doing some uh, nice and, uh, research and development. I just wanted to show you because you, I guess you know the range uh, of Monde. I don't want to do uh, um, kind of advertising of, uh, but that product is just a, a limited edition that our new master blender, Trudy Ann Brunker, so first female master blender uh, in Barbados uh, last year. Trudy Ann worked for us uh, for six years at Quality and she was shadowing uh, Alan Smith, our, our previous master blender for, for six years or so. And the first product, it's why it's interesting. The first product when we ask her, okay, first limited edition, what do you want to do? I mean, you have uh, carte blanche, as we say. So, and she said, I, I want to do 100% pot steel rum. So what she did, uh, she selected um, a 10 years old pot steel rum, uh, aged in bourbon cask. And it's really to link back to our tradition. Pot steel is really, uh, even it's probably 18% um, of what we do, majority is column steel. But the idea of Pot steel is important to the Barbados tradition or Barbados distillation tradition. So uh, she thought, Trudian thought that it was important to go back and release something special. I mean, it's just 5,000 bottles, but just to release it and to, uh, to show the craft. And uh, because pot steel, it's all manual again. And so it's uh, the cuts, etc. So it's... Um, but it's an interesting product, so I just wanted to show it to you. I'm not sure if we can find it in Canada, by the way, but it's um, just to, yeah, to show uh, what, what we can do also at Monday. Raphael, just a question for you about maturation. You talked yep. about that angel share being in the double digits for the first five years. Does it stabilize after that? Or is yes, 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 yes. Okay. It's, it's, it, well, it actually, it's, it's declining, thank God. Uh, but we are more around six seven percent after afterwards but the first years it's where because you have also higher we're barreling uh, usually at 70 71 percent alcohol uh, percent of alcohol per volume um, and um, yeah thank you robert saying trudian is uh, awesome she is she's a great spirit creative and we love her but yeah so after i think uh, yeah the, the 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 evaporation is declining uh, evaporation rate is declining but still, uh, when you make the, your calculation, when you have a 10 years old, so what we, uh, product you have lots of loss or evaporation, what we do, we, we don't do like uh, in some countries where, what we call, they call, uh, not a big fan of that, we call it solera. We don't do this kind of thing. So we don't mix, we don't blend, we age separately or, 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 or batch or liquids. And then we do our blend. What we do, we can do, is when we have a batch of distillation, so for example, we are running a, a pot steel batch for three, four days of distillation, we exhaust our, our fermentation uh, batch. This batch, so as a batch number, we do 20, 25 barrels. What happens with the time? We consolidate the barrel. So if at, at age zero, uh, D1, you have 25 barrels, after 10 years, we have probably 15 barrels. So we're consolidating in order to avoid the, the, the excess of evaporation. So that we, and also a gain of space, a gain of space in, 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 our, in our cellar. So that we, we, we can do, but we never blend prior to blending. So it's really uh, all liquids are aged separately in their own cask, etc. So that is it's quite important too. Just Sorry, I'm talking a lot. Huh? So. <laughs> Sorry if I'm talking too much. You stop no, me. it's perfect. Just by comparison, though, I'm wondering if Alex at Compass, do you know your uh, angel share or your evaporation loss rate, for instance, at the Citadel? Is it more of a Scottish kind of two or three percent loss per year? 
Um, right now, we're still at the, we're still still so young that we're not really aging okay. like more than a year. Lynn and Pierre, do you have an idea what your evaporative loss is? We're we're averaging five percent. Okay. But we're, we're, we tend to lose, if, and I may be guessing here, but I think that in the northern climates, we lose more alcohol, and, le, and, and in the southern climates, they lose more water. Yes, yeah. that's right. More volume. Yeah. On humidity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So you guys, have it, you guys have it better down south. <laughs> uh, William, I have a question for you as well that's coming from the audience. And it has to do, I guess, what we'd call uh, with ethical sourcing or fair trade. I mean, we know that labor practices are better now than they were a couple hundred years ago, but there's still sugar plantations take up a lot of space. They're very labor intensive. As countries develop, that land is sometimes has a lot of demands on it. Is that a concern for you when you're working with suppliers is uh, sort of ethical production and how do you keep an eye on that in developing economies? Yes, it is. Um, and we basically source it all exclusively from the Madre Tierra mill in, in Guatemala, uh, through brokered through a, a company in the US. Um, and I've gone down to personally visit the mill myself. Um, so I was down there in, in 2016 and seen it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's always a concern um, sourcing from, from those countries. But uh, they are one of the better better mills in the region. Yeah. Is there a certification the good thing you look for? So, or? Sorry. Sorry? Go ahead, please. Now, the good thing also is that now there's some certification, so that is helping us and guiding us. So uh, the Bon Sucro uh, uh, or the, um, what is it, Terra? Uh, I forgot the name right now. But yeah, we have, there's some certification also, which is guiding us uh, to, uh, to the best in class. Uh, so that is also something important, yeah. Good, so that's something consumers can look for if they're concerned with that. Yeah, yeah. Bon Sucro and Proterra are the big ones, yeah. Okay. Any other questions from our viewers or do any of the panelists have questions for each other? Because you've shared some interesting practices that in some ways have a very common thread of production, but they're quite different uh, based on where you're located and how you're operating too. I'm wondering how bl important blending is to the craft distillers who often don't have the luxury of a large inventory of different marks, heavy characterful marks of rum or light column distilled rums to blend and maybe it's more of a single cask release, whereas at a big company like Mount Gay, the importance of blending is really there. What do you think? We tend to do mostly single cast, but as part of the experimentation, certainly the, the for instance, the rumbo rum is blended from uh, used bourbon casks and from new oak casks. And, um, uh, and, uh, and now most of it is entirely aged on the boat. But in the beginning, as the boat was out for a period of time, it was blended with some of the uh, rather fresh rums from the cellar but uh, uh, so blending is part of it but not a, not a huge we uh, we do mostly do the single cast okay that's what i thought um, um go ahead alex yeah yeah uh for us here the first little bit we were kind of just doing single cask um but as i'm building up a supply of uh barrels and we tend to use a, a lot of different things, like uh, we use some new oak uh, of different char levels. Uh, we reuse our rum barrels with rum again, and uh, we also have some bourbon barrels. And uh, with all the different kind of experimenting that we're doing too, um, it gives us a bit of opportunity to get some interesting kind of uh, flavors and characters by blending some of the different barrels we've got. Yeah. Um, Raphael, just a couple of questions for you. First of all, I'm wondering if you can talk about the difference between um, a sort of a wet cellar and a dry cellar. So evaporative loss of alcohol versus loss of water. And then number two, someone here is asking what the oldest casks at Mount Gay are. <laughs> uh, oldest cask, um, it's probably 28. We, we used to have uh, 30 years old, but we took off from the cask because after, in fact, for me, uh, it's personal, but uh, there's a kind of bell curve and, and really between 15 and 18 years old, you, have, you reach a peak in terms of maturation. 
and after you tend to to pick up lots of uh, wood uh, notes and can overpower the, the wood can overpower so usually we have uh, 25 27 it's max 28 i think or 30 but by the way when we reach this age we take off from wood and and they are uh, in um, stainless steel tank because we don't want a, a more evolution what we do also from 15 17 years old we are changing cask we can change to a, a degrade so a, a grade of barrel where a barrel which is quite exhausted in terms of tannin for example so you have less influence of the wood because in fact 15 i mean uh, i know some brands like to uh, to showcase um, some 23 i mean there are numbers but uh, I don't know if they are real, but some, really the quality is not necessarily associated to do it. And you can have a very nice rum. Uh, we, say, we said it uh, earlier, young, young rum, and you have different qualities. So it's not necessarily the, the older or the more mature, the better, I, I would say. So, and for me, again, I think there's a, there's a, there's a peak around the 15, 18 uh, uh, years old. But again, it depends on which kind of liquid you have which kind of barrels because you can have a, a, a totally exhausted barrel i mean uh, at 18 years old you will have a quite weak uh, liquid also so in fact when you play with a matrix with all the elements which are influencing the taste and i mean there's like uh, probably hundreds of uh, entries you know so it's uh, quite uh, it's quite complex so yeah but the, the bulk of what we have yeah it's uh, it's around uh, 18 uh, yeah 18 years old it's what uh, yeah we go up to that yeah. That's an important point that um, we're sort of trained to believe by age statements on different spirit products that maturation equals quality. And it's yeah. not always the case. Maturation yeah. equals yeah. age in some cases. Yeah. It's also uh, for us at Monge always been the case, but we never uh, showcase any, um, any age statement because we think it's reductive. So, we are very transparent. We are explaining always on the back label what is the blend uh, made with. So uh, the age of the column steel, the, the minimum, the maximum, etc. Or the minimum, sorry, a minimum of pot, etc. But uh, we think because when you put a number of 12 or 15, uh, it's an entry point. And at the end of the day, the taste, uh, what you're looking for, the quality or the difference of uh, flavors, yeah, it's different. So I'm not saying that the five years is necessarily uh, less good than the 12. I, for me, they are different. They are bringing something very different uh, to, um, to the style of the, of the room. So, and they're also, after it's also a moment of consumption. So it depends what you want to do with the rum, how you drink it, you know. So it's, uh, and, and you need a rum, and there's a rum for any moment. So uh, for cocktails, very fresh cocktail, for most sophisticated and complex cocktail. You have rums, of course, uh, to be drink uh, neat or on, on, on ice, uh, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, William, just back to you with another molasses question. Uh, is fancy molasses something that's kind of uh, a common term across brands or does your fancy from Guatemala differ from a fancy from another origin or plantation or producer? Yeah, I was just uh, trying to answer that one in the chat there. Um, so fancy molasses, it's a, it's a standard of identity from the TFIA. Um, so it's not really a term that's used so much in, in the U.S. Um, in the U.S., they would use like high test molasses or okay. juice molasses, as a, or even light molasses would be another uh, uh, term they use. But that one's kind of broader in terms of what it can uh, refer to. Uh, but in Canada, it's a very strict standard of identity. Um, so there's specific criteria, and it has to be directly from cane juice, uh, of which nothing else has previously been extracted. It has to have 25% uh, uh, moisture and less than 3% ash. So if it, if it doesn't meet those criteria, then it's not fancy molasses in Canada. So in other words, it's a super high quality product. I actually yeah. a higher quality product than a lot of distilleries around the world would be using. It's more of a consumer grade product than a commercial. Yeah, and it's it's often, well, it's it's edible molasses is what they also call it. So table molasses or molasses that's used uh, as a spread or uh, an ingredient, but. And is it pasteurized, William, your molasses? Yes. Yeah, and why is that important? Uh, the important, well, it makes it 
food grade technically, um, and it also knocks back the, the yeast activity, so reduces the chance of um, fermentation starting on its own, which is important when you're packaging it for shelf life. And, uh, for sure. And one more question I'll throw out to everybody, although it was specifically asked to Raphael. Um, what about the idea of premium white rums, which presumably would be either straight off the still or perhaps with a short maturation and the color filtered out. Is that something we see trending and something anybody's planning to produce? Um, well, if I may, yeah, I, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure there's room for that because it's, uh, uh, there's uh, clearly a demand for more premium uh, rums and, uh, and spirit in general. So yeah, for white rum with a, a particular taste profile, I'm sure, yeah. Could be a pure pot steel or yeah, for sure. Sure. We haven't made any um, white rum until recently. Um, we could. I mean, it, it rum in Canada has to be aged for at least a year. Um, yes. So in order to get white rum, of course, you have to charcoal filter that color out. Um, I find, personally, you lose flavor when you do that kind of charcoal filtering. Um, so I would be very hesitant to call our rum white rum premium. Um, it's just a very pleasant white rum. People like it for um, mojitos and, and those kind of cocktails that require or call for a white rum. I would argue that our, um, we have, we used to do what we call a light rum, which was basically the one year old rum, uh, very fresh, um, no caramel added. Um, and it was, it was kind of our variation of a white rum, but we didn't charcoal filter that flavor out. Um, is, there a, is there a call for it? Conceivably. And that conversation and, and argument goes back and forth and we may make it, who knows? Okay. You can imagine, it's true, you can imagine a, a white rum. So if you don't emphasize on the aging, etc., uh, part of the, of the process, you can emphasize on the fermentation. You can have an extra long fermentation. You can have a specific uh, distillation and you can have a flamboyant uh, flavor profile. Yeah, why not? And, and because it will take time, because it, there will be lots of craft, you can consider it as effectively a, a premium or, or whatever. I mean, high end if, if you want. Yeah, I like this. I like this idea. And, but it's different from a uh, rum that has been aged, etc. But why not? There's craft. I mean, there's there's an art in it, so yeah, it qualifies for me, of course. And it's a good point you make about cocktails because, of course, with the popularity resurgence of tiki style cocktails and tropical style drinks, a lot of people do want a very characterful white rum that really stands on its own in that drink. So I think there's a place for it. Yeah. Um, we are getting to that time where I think we should be wrapping up. So if anybody has Additional questions, please bang them out right now. Otherwise, I will start to thank our panelists very much for your time. And uh, Matt, maybe turn it back to you to wrap up and let people know where they can find out about upcoming sessions. Yeah, that was fantastic. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thanks for being such a great moderator and uh, very, very hard to sum up rum production in 90 minutes. And I think you folks did an outstanding job. So. Um, thank you all very much. You can uh, check out the mynslc.com if you'd like to order any of the Nova Scotia Bay Spirits and Mount Gay Spirits. Um, you, can, you can find those on mynslc.com. And if you want to find out more about our um, organization, Drink Atlantic, of course, check out drinkatlantic.com and NSLC as well as some information on there. Um, thanks to Dorico Simons for attending as well and Ace Halifax. You can find them at um, Ace Halifax on Instagram, facebook.com slash Ace Halifax. So if you're looking for somewhere to support in Halifax, that's a very great starting point. Um, Alex, Lynn, Pierre, Raphael, Charlene, thank Rob, thank you so much for putting this together. Um, thank we you. Have we have an excellent seminar tomorrow as well with Dorothy Elizabeth out of uh, New York City. It's going to be a molecular mixology at home. So for all of you nice. mixologists at home yeah. who are looking to get a little bit more education, um, Dorothy's got some fantastic tricks um, that we, she can share. Right on. Thank you, everybody. Let's Thank all have you. a little drink of rum. I think it is uh, International Pineapple today. So I think maybe oh. pina coladas are in order.
Okay, cheers. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.